This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not intended to provide medical advice. It exists only to entertain. In 1948, a notable physicist goes to see his surgeon, Dr. Nissen, at Brooklyn Jewish Hospital in New York City to discuss an impending problem. Oh, hello there, Al. What brings you in to see me? I have this pain in my abdomen. It's not going away, I'm afraid. Well, let's uh, let's have you hop on the examination table here and see what we find. All right. Oh, oh what, well, what is it? This steel is cold on my buns. It was not ready for that. Well, you, you've... Got the gown on all wrong. Didn't you have a Nobel Prize? Isn't that what I remember? Intelligence is relative, if you ask me. Anyway, go ahead and lie back. Let's do an exam. Okay, okay. Where does it hurt? Right here above the belly button in my tummy. Now, we call that an umbilicus. Whatever. Well, let's see. Hmm. What is it? I'm not sure I like what I'm feeling. Put your hand here on your abdomen with mine. Okay. Yeah, do do you feel that pulsing balloon there where you keep having pain? I do. Well, I think you have what's called an aortic aneurysm. The largest blood vessel in your abdomen could burst at any time if we don't do something. That doesn't sound good, but but what can be done? Well, you will need a surgery. We need to contain the ballooning aorta. You see, the blood pulsing inside will continue to exert a force on the walls of the blood vessel, and with that pressure... Oh, do you want to discuss physics? Uh... Uh, no, no, not my thing. It's too bad. It's too bad. Uh, but how do you resist the forces you are mentioning in the surgery? Well, we, we take the aorta and we wrap it up tight so it can't expand anymore. Ah, simple yet elegant. That seems to make sense. Is it a difficult procedure? Well, it's not astrophysics, but sometimes the cling wrap gets stuck and twisted and doesn't cut right, so there's some technique involved. The, uh, what? Yeah, we use cellophane to wrap your aneurysm to prevent it from exploding. You said clean wrap. Yeah, I mean, same difference. I'm not sure I like where this is going. We'll use a fresh package, so it's all clean and stuff, don't worry. <sighs> what, what other choice do I have? Well, you, you could let that guy over there do the procedure. Ha <laughs> ha! The aorta is layers like a fine lasagna. What's his name? Uh, that's Dr. Provolone. Is he credentialed? I'm not sure how it happened, but uh, I I want to say yes. I think I'll go with the cellophane. Think, uh, believe it or not. Yeah, yeah, good call, good call. Oh, I feel like that's a bad idea. <laughs> oh, hey, Al, can I can I see your Nobel and just like you know hold it for just a minute? No, I don't think so. Oh. You wrap it in cellophane, too tight. (laughs) (laughs) There it Welcome, everyone. This is Poor Historians, a podcast delving into the archives of medical history. As three emergency physicians, we will explore the unusual ailments, treatments, physicians, and all related material having to do with the healing arts. I'm Max, and I'm joined here by my good friends and colleagues, Aaron and Mike. Gentlemen, are you ready to contemplate the incredible fragility of life? Oh, I'm always ready to contemplate that. Yeah, it's... same. I, oh, I just don't like thinking about this stuff. <laughs> No, oh, then let's just, let's just stop the episode now. <laughs> yeah, just like, oh, when's mine going to pop? Oh, yeah. Well, I, 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 nobody knows. <laughs> That's so the we're, fun we're part. Not only, are we going from, so we're going from doing a lighthearted humor medical history podcast to like an anxiety provoking podcast? Is that mm-hmm. what we're doing now? Yeah, oh, yeah. I, we want. I think there's you know, got to be an audience for it. So yeah, any, uh, any, I think we have a shout out this week, don't we not? Yeah, so I was I was working the other day really busy, and I had to send a patient to a big hospital. And as um, it, lots of times there are call centers where we call people, uh, 
and I was really busy and stressed out, and it made my day when uh, Wendy, the nurse who answered the phone to sort of take my call, kind of interrupted me as I was talking to her and said, hey, I'm, I'm a giant fan of the podcast. And I was like, what the heck? So um, <laughs> it just was really wonderful, it put me at ease, and uh, was a great, a, a great sort of fun thing. And it turns out one of our other friends, we'll just call him Dr. Ryan, has, has been uh, saying the good word about our podcast to a bunch of his work associates and such, and uh, we really appreciate him. But I also really appreciate Wendy taking the time to to just sort of make me feel good in the middle of a terrible shift. So yeah, that's a really good shout out. That's that's yeah, it, it was really fun. So and we appreciate all the all the work everyone does, but just taking the time out to be human it makes us makes our jobs a lot easier. Be human, get a shout out. It's easy. Yeah, yeah. See, low bar. I like it. Yeah, Mike, do you ever get uh, accosted by fans? No, because my voice is like just nauseating to listen to. So I think people <laughs> usually like they just plug their ears when I talk. <laughs> but I Aaron's got a good radio voice. I don't think that's not true. not today, man. I'm so nasally. I, I feel very No, I think uh, it's good. It sounds a little bit more baritone. Maybe try <laughs> drink some whiskey and then let's get mm-hmm. to Oh well, well whiskey will it. be appropriate for the topic. Mm, indeed. Well speaking of which, so Aaron, you, you found another topic that lends itself to a lighthearted medical history podcast, did you not? Yes I did. I'm gonna draw a connection between King George the Second and Stray Dogs in Buenos Aires, and it's going to be a fun ride. Mm, get out the yarns and push pin. Here we go. Yeah, I'm also trying a new. So I'm I'm also very just the topic makes me nervous, but also bullet points make me nervous. I don't even have <laughs> normally. I just read a thing. So One, we're going to see. Two, so three, you wrote, four, so five, you wrote six bullet points. points. You're like listener. This might go off the, the lines. You're confronting your fear. I appreciate I am, that. Right here on air. Well, it was like me doing the last one where I wrote prose. I was like, this is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading this stupid thing that I wrote, and I'm stupid. No, you don't no. stupid. <laughs> One of those things that I laughed really hard doing the edit on is when Mike <laughs> was like, I can't read. I'm just going <laughs> to. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's get to it, Aaron. Let's yeah, let's talk get about to the intro. Dogs so, a previous king of England. England, yep. So King George II, uh, this is the dad of the one that we have a bit of a problem with. I mean, we'll I don't co- have a personal problem with King George III. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that. I wasn't yeah. alive when he was doing stuff. But I don't think he was. He he didn't really do anything bad. Right? I mean, he was the the king during the American Revolution. But yeah, he was in charge. So no, he he didn't. You know, like, well, except for the imperialism and subjugation and massacres. Well, he and, didn't mm-hmm. do that. That had been <laughs> yeah, course, happening over the course. He of oversaw thousands people of years. doing it. It's well, he oversaw different. people. Yeah, it's true, right? He was just giving orders. Is, is that the defense? No, but he, yeah, he defense. just like he was he just giving orders. He didn't put he didn't carry him out. <laughs> yeah, it's not like he went out and got the places. He didn't like, ask to be king at that time. It's not his fault. <laughs> so anyway, King George, he's an early riser. He's a rising grind guy. So he woke up like he always <laughs> did, six a.m. Uh, in the morning, an October, October morning in 1760, is a little chilly in the palace, so he had his normal morning cup of hot chocolate. I don't know how to explain that. I'm sorry. Um, I actually, and... I know a little something about that because like, it's weird to have hot chocolate first thing in the morning, but hot chocolate as a commodity and thing you could have was such a mm. expensive luxury that pretty much only nobility and royals could ever afford to have it because you had to, you had to get it from like the chocolate factories and wherever that comes from, far away from where he lived. Yeah. So, where did he get the yeah. cheesecake? <laughs> at the cheesecake factory. <laughs> so he went, he had, his, he had his hot chocolate, and he went for his morning constitutional. And sadly, You're taking, he, he drank a, a cup of, a cup of, <laughs> of hot chocolate and took a dump. Yes, yeah, that was his morning. <laughs> it was sadly his last movement. Um, and, mm. you know, they just... They call that a finale in symphonic terms. <laughs> uh, yes. Mm. Yeah, no coda though. Um, and just, you know, this backs up my total phobia of uh, pushing too hard when I go to the bathroom because within a minute, his valet heard a crash from the other room and found the king stone dead next to his chamber pot. was how he went out. Mm. And because he was famous and the king, he had a, an autopsy. It's unusual at the time. And, and he is credited with sort of the first official... Uh, thoracic aortic dissection, um, described by the like physician the first in history? Frank Nichols. I'm willing to bet well, it wasn't the first in history. So, no, it definitely wasn't the first in history. And I did try to look around to see who else had maybe described this. I, I saw some 
uh, internet sleuthing that said uh, Vesalius had described it and so on. But this was, this is sort of credited. Some people say the first, and I'm like, eh. <laughs> First documented. Maybe. Yeah, that. first well documented first okay, aortic fair. dissection. Yeah, so Frank so Nichols gets that. Aortas. Yeah, and and he had a, a complete description of the condition. Um, so he described a fissure along the inside of the aorta that had stretched the right side of the heart and blocked blood returning from the pulmonary arteries to the heart. So see how it gets complicated quickly. So I thought it would be kind of nice to talk about the aorta, you know, a little bit. Just, I mean, we're not an advice podcast and such, but I, I think we have listeners who aren't as medical. So, yeah, so it's this big candy cane blood vessel that comes out of the top of your heart in the middle of your chest and loops around uh, right under kind of your neck and then goes down on the back all the way to all your other organs. So this is the big dealio artery that starts everything. The, the major pipeline if yep. you will, for the body. The, the All the blood pipeline. coming out of the heart has to go right through this thing, go up to your head, go out to your arms, go down through your abdomen, out to your organs. And yeah, and this is the it, good blood. This is the blood with the oxygen, right? So, yeah, it's the good, not the bad blood. We don't want right. the bad blood. It's a little and, uh, squeamish. Yeah, I bad blood like, leaves the heart, goes to the lungs, comes back, and then it with the oxygen, and then it's like, whoop, here we go to, to do its job. <laughs> and it's also probably worth mentioning that the first, so it has this big, and you said candy cane because it's kind of like the shape of it. But this big tube, uh, this big muscular artery comes out of the heart. The first branches or blood vessels that come off of it are your coronary arteries. So your arteries that give blood to the muscle of the heart. So they get the freshest, freshest blood first, and then the rest of it goes. I'm mentioning that now because it might come up later. Yeah. Oh, it definitely, it definitely might. Yes. And you could say the heart is selfish, but because it feeds itself first... But it only feeds itself after everybody else has had blood, right? I do the so same the, thing. the heart well, it's fills. It's like putting an oxygen mask on yourself first, <laughs> and then your kids. Which is what you're plane. supposed to do, right? So yeah. it's actually it's good design. But actually, the heart fills. I actually look at my neighbor's oxygen mask, like I know where it's going to fall, and I will <laughs> grab try it. to grab both of them and put them on my face. Especially if it's a kid, right, man? Mm -hmm. Got you. Oh yeah. You don't need this. <laughs> They're too short to reach it. <laughs> And in general, we talk about this. We talk about the aorta as ascending. So when it comes out of the heart, it's going up. And then it makes a big curve and it goes down. So we talk about the ascending and the descending aorta, which is important. Um, but maybe a little beyond what we absolutely need. And so why does it, it, it'll tear, but it doesn't always rupture. So there's this dissection is actually a tear in the wall of the aorta. And why would it do that? I mean, that's kind of crazy. How does a blood vessel do that? It's because it has so many layers. So... It's full of different layers. There's an inner layer that's like uh, like the inside of all the other blood vessels. Then there's a bunch of elastic connective tissue stuff. And then there's the outer wall. And there's muscles in there too. So it's got, it's a pretty cool organ. Um, it has up to 50 layers of sort of connective tissue called elastin in there that are kind of interwoven. So like carbon fiber can suck it. Because this lasts your whole life and it distends, which just gets bigger, gets smaller every single time you have a heartbeat, which is really, really amazing. Yeah. Like every every single you know, heartbeat, it this 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 giant muscular artery gets hammered with pressure, right? So all yeah. you know, four what is it, like five billion beats is the average heart. So this thing has to take a it takes a lot of pressure over time. And it's it's impressive like when you're in medical school doing dissections and you, you have to like open up the chest cavity and, and see what these things look like and you feel them and you, you touch them and you're it, it gives you an appreciation for how strong and tough this tissue is because it has to be. Yeah, yeah. And this what I'm saying is a huge simplification. So that's how it rips though, is because it has these multiple layers, it'll tear the inner part of the lining and then the blood gets in between those layers so especially and i'm sure you'll go into it but especially if you have conditions that make those layers a little bit stretchier than you want them to be yeah yeah we will get to that yes so when you talk about it in the news and this this is and there's a reason for this confusion which we'll get to later that's another put a pin in it issue so aneurysm versus dissection versus rupture versus transection so there's all these things that can happen to the aorta an aneurysm means that over time, the pressure, if there's a little turbulent flow and the pressure causes uh, ballooning of the aorta or enlargement of the aorta. It can happen in the chest. It can happen in the belly. They're not the same. They're not treated the same. They don't act the same. And it's different from a dissection, which is that tear in the wall of the blood vessel itself. 
Um, and then aneurysms can either, I mean, you, they can dissect so that it gets even more confusing, but, um, they can also just rupture, which I mean, they pop, which is what right. it sounds like. Um, and so like just to summarize partly for myself too, aneurysm is just the ballooning, which is a danger because they can break. And then dissection is an, an aorta that may actually look overall normal in size, but blood has managed to cut or dissect into the inner layer of it. And then and that will cause problems as you continue to pump more blood into that dissected area. Yep. Yep. And then the last one, transection, you just, in certain traumatic situations, you just kind of just cut the whole thing. And that's it's, bad, right? I it's laugh bad. just be, because of the sheer terribleness of it, right? So um, major car accidents where you hit an embankment or something like that, if you have that sudden deceleration, it'll just tear this thing in half. And that's that's almost always. And, and why does this matter? Well, it doesn't because all these things are bad and you know i mean i don't think it's fair to ask the general public and the media to understand all of this stuff but you'll see this messed up all the time in in media and reports and such right so they are different and they're treated differently so it's kind of you know uh one of those pet peeves that i keep to myself at parties be like god that's not a yeah so now it, it gets even worse because there was apparently these initial terms were, were messed up. There was a stupid French doctor, Rene Lenaic, just annoying mm. to say his name. So he mm -hmm. actually, in 1819, coined the term dissecting aneurysm, which is a total pud thing to do because he messed it up right there. Like, what is that? That's the two things. No, you have to, one or the other. So, and everyone copied this because he was the more famous guy. There was a Theo Manure, <laughs> also French, poor guy. Let's see. I think people didn't want to listen to him because his name was Manure. And he described well, aortic... Because it would be Theo <laughs> Maird, right? <laughs> Yeah, probably true. So maybe it didn't catch on in America because of that. I don't know. Maybe so it was he, pronounced Manour. It's M-A-N-O-U-R. Manois. Labor. It's probably Manois. I'm Manoir. nailing all it's this French now. stuff. You know I am. Manoir. You know I am. Manoir. So he described aortic dissection in 1802, which is like 15 years before the other guy. But Theo was Swiss. Nobody cares what the Swiss think. <laughs> and all he did was co-found the Red Cross, which we all know that uh, you know the nurses were doing all the work. Um, Nightingale probably did all the work. So, so and Linnaeus invented the the damn stethoscope and and even came mm. up with whispered pectoriloquy, which is the most important physical exam finding you can you can have. I like uh, that we're finding out how much yeah. Aaron hates old timey <laughs> physical exam maneuvers. Like he, the listener can't see it, but you can actually see the disdain in his writing right now on on the page. It doesn't translate as well, but you you just look at it and it's just dripping with animus. What oh, else? Man. What's another one? What's your favorite, Max? So my favorite old time or the one that I hate? Um, the old time <laughs> one that you hate. Ooh. Um, there's a lot of them. So just a little background for the listener who may not be, you know, steeped just in the say medicine. It. Just say <laughs> it. <laughs> we learn a lot of silly, seemingly silly, and almost difficult to reproduce physical exam maneuvers in the age of ultrasound and x-ray and cat scan and mri and those sort of things and so we are also however tasked with learning all these exam maneuvers and actually why don't while i'm thinking of this aaron can you describe what whispered pectroliloquy is oh i forget which one this is i think um you whisper while the doctor is listening to your lungs and it's louder mm -hmm. where the pneumonia is is that right that so might be you that might be egophony. No, I no, actually no, did look it up before this yeah. because I couldn't remember. So yeah. <laughs> you, yes. Yeah, so this theoretically for the listener is where your doctor may suspect, it, you know, old timey doctor thinks you might have pneumonia. So if you don't have pneumonia, you've got air through your lungs when you take a breath in. And so if the, you have a stethoscope on your back and the doctor's listening and you whisper something, it's actually, you don't really hear anything because the sound just doesn't get transmitted very well. Right. But if you have a big old pneumonia, like a chunk of, pus filled lung tissue that becomes more dense if you whisper something theoretically the doc could hear through the stethoscope the whispering tones much more clearly because that solid or yeah, more solid material transmits solid. the sound yeah this sounds as convoluted as it probably is in real practice <laughs> uh, i don't i'm trying Not to think i don't then. think i've had this done well no back then is different right oh you yeah don't you have, have to do it you don't have those things so you have to do it in your oski Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OSCE being the uh, standardized 
pretending to examine a patient uh, during medical school kind of thing. And that's probably the last time I did this, to to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Do you get to the point where it's like, now I'll fondle your genitals? <laughs> and everyone gets really weird. I think you failed that ASCII, buddy. I don't think <laughs> Just by using plus. the word fondle, man, you're done. You get I'm out. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. That's an F. Stroke? F. What do you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so egophony and I... Like when you say E and it sounds like an A, E to A, Gophany. If you have yeah, pneumonia, chest, you're listening. You're like, listening say maneuver. E and Tactile then fremitus. That's another one of my oh, favorites. Oh, that's a great, it's a great named finding. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's an now, incredible. Tactile one fremitus the, is, that's, I think that's just smoke and mirrors. There's no way that works. Yeah. Don't you hear That's like, a great band name though. Mucus. Yeah. Mm. I, I still do percussion um, for abdominal exams. Yeah. I went, I was working with that a one's PA. That useful. This, yeah. This, this lady had abdominal pain and. She's like, would you just come in? I don't know if we need to do a CT. So I go in and I, I push and I percuss. And she's looked at me like, what in the hell are you doing? Like, I just really? you everybody describe the percussion? That was pretty legit. What, yeah, what, what do you, you do take, when you percuss? Well, you take your finger because otherwise you're just whacking somebody in the belly and probably won't make a lot of sound. So you use the your finger and you just hit your finger with your other finger. Um, right on you press the, the finger usually, onto the usually, skin yep. and then you tap yeah, over the tap fingernail. The, to... The finger on the skin, yep. Yeah. So then if, if there's like a bowel obstruction or free air in the belly, that's going to sound like you're hitting a drum. It just sounds more hollow. Yeah. I, I, that is one I've used. I guess I have to keep from doing that like a lot. If there's good timpani, you know, you're like, boom, boom, <laughs> and you're like, oh, that's kind of fun. I'm going to do it some more. And then you're like, okay, I have enough now. I, but sorry. here's the question, that's... Mike. Here's the inside baseball question. Do yeah. you percuss before or after you palpate? I do it after. Is it, is, well, you uh, well, Are you supposed well, well, to percuss before? It all depends. It all depends on how distended <laughs> their abdomen around? is. If their abdomen is super distended, I probably percuss first. But I usually I go on. You know, <laughs> there was always that thing where like it was like you always you percuss a... before palpation, so you don't change the exam. It's like, oh come on, no, you gotta, give me a I usually give acute abdomen is yeah. an acute abdomen. I do a lot of morphine and then I palpate and then I well seriously like, for you, if you or the patient. I'm just kidding. No, but if you push, <laughs> like if it's just a fart, then you're just gonna push the fart out and you won't percuss That's anything. True. Which is funny because all we do is send them to CT anyway. I know. <laughs> just, but back then. And everybody listening is like, wait, is this really three ER doctors talking about physical exam? Because you know mm -hmm. all they do is send them to CT. I like, never yeah, said correct. I used my stethoscope. I used my finger. <laughs> <laughs> so what causes anyway. an aortic uh, <laughs> dissection? Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, a lot of causes. Um, high blood pressure is the main one. Uh, that's, uh, just over time because that pressure's increased, right? You're looking at the, the shear forces, there's physics involved. So it's not, it's a multiplicative change when you have increased pressure. Uh, a certain number of people are born with a, the valve that opens to go into the aorta it usually has three parts and a certain number of people are born with two parts and that causes a change in pressure. So that's a very common cause. Cocaine does it. So this mm, is definitely mm. one of the emergencies that'll get you with cocaine in addition to bleeding in the head and sudden rhythm changes of your heart that cause a cardiac arrest and, and actual awesome normal heart attack. Movie crack yes. is whack. Yeah, crack is, crack is definitely whack. This is another one of my phobias. This is why I, well... There are a lot of reasons I didn't try cocaine <laughs> in high school. The but only like, reason. This one, like this was in one of my early health ed classes. And I was like, oh my God. They're like, you could try it one time and die. And I was like, From a dissecting aneurysm. And actually they're kind of right. You know, this you, is cocaine is the one. Basospasm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, you could, could you could die off a single hit of cocaine. It's true. Uh, mm -hmm. especially if you have structural heart disease. But that's another thing. I thought then this wasn't an advice podcast. But we well, just definitively said don't, don't do, do drugs. Cocaine. I think yeah. <laughs> don't do drugs. Don't okay, give well. any advice <laughs> of any kind on this podcast. No. Okay, sorry. You know, you do you. Uh, there's the mm -hmm. potential that cocaine. Wait, are you might telling kill you. listeners to do cocaine now? No, <laughs> no. He's telling them to do you. <laughs> yes. That's not. I don't consent. <laughs> All right. So then I'm just gonna soldier on here. There's a bunch of uh, I would say relatively recently understood or or diagnosed uh, genetic disorders. Ehlers Danlos is one. There's a connective tissue form and a vascular form, so one that affects the joints more and one that affects the blood vessels. Makes the elastic uh, too elastic. Yeah, uh, Marfan syndrome and Loewy's Dietz syndrome. This one I uh, I think I've seen that more in the last four or five years. So I've never even heard that. Term. Yeah, I've seen those words before. Yeah, you know, I had a, uh, I had uh, somebody come in and basically educate me about it, oh. which is great. Uh, this is a place where patient advocacy is a good thing. So if people, hello, have I was these, at the Mayo Clinic know. and I was diagnosed with Lowy's <laughs> Dietz 
Syndrome. Well, but the, if they're right, you know, <laughs> no, I mean, that's important yeah, that information. That has happened to me multiple yeah. times. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. been like yeah. once or twice in my career where somebody has come in with a syndrome that they have to you look know, it up. A, oh, three yeah. people in the world have, and they're like, I, yeah. they are they're the expert gonna, in it because they're yeah, going to know way more about it than, than I do. We got to know all this stuff. They know the <laughs> yep. one thing yep. and, and really well. But all of these cause some problem with the connective tissues match set. So this max set. So the elastic tissues in your body that make stuff stretch, they don't form right with these problems. So the blood vessels are very uh, brittle or fragile and they tear more easily. So they, yeah, those tend to happen at younger ages. And then syphilis does this, but ah, mm, syphilis. Not, not so much now because, you know, we have treatments for it. It was, it has to be uh, late stage syphilis. It's tertiary. So it's not, yeah. So also Ordinary. don't have sex. You might die right away. No, that's yeah. not accurate. Um, yeah, syphilis, you would have to be infected for years and years, and then eventually it can cause dissections. Probably because it just makes you fall apart slowly. I think it, ca I think it causes inflammation in the aorta, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. it causes... Um, uh, Aortitis. Like, yeah, abscesses. <laughs> I saw this yeah. once. I think I've... Maybe I've shared it. Bad. And I don't know that it was syphilis, but it was a mycotic... Yeah. aneurysm so it wasn't See, a dissection those, so i'll just stop two. talking yep <laughs> no that's okay when well, we're talking about the aorta lots of bad oh, things you're, can right, you're right yeah. you're right you're yeah. right yeah anyway it didn't go well no, no no yeah mycotic right so you can get an infection that causes an ulcer or uh, a pouching but it, because it's infected it's even worse because it's going to eat into the wall yeah a lot of nightmare fuel. It, it, so just to make things better it's extraordinarily hard to diagnose so <laughs> It's rare. People have tried to to look at studies to figure out how we can catch it in in medicine, and it's it, it's hard because it's rare. So there's they did a study where they it took forty one thousand chest pain patients to find one hundred twenty eight that were actually diagnosed with aneurysm. So point zero zero three yeah dissection. Sorry, oh jeez. See here, I'm Come doing on, it. Bro. Oh, cut that. Oh, Show's cut over. that. Cut that. <laughs> oh, one of our guys doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it's it's rough. So nobody knows exactly the best way to find it. You know, again, we're not an advice podcast, but sudden severe pain in the chest, especially pain that goes into the back, chest pain with neurologic symptoms like you can't move stuff, and chest pain if you faint um, are some of the hallmarks. But again, none of those are perfect. And unfortunately, 40% of people that die, so 40% of people that have dissections die before they even get to the hospital, according to the American Heart Association, which, you know, um, yeah, it's not great. So mm -mm. Mm -mm. yeah, I've seen, I, I, so I, I think every ER doctor assumes dissection we look for them a lot right because yeah. they are so bad and you have to think about it. the problem is testing for them it's a lot of radiation with cat scans and those sort of things so we are ever desperate looking for things in the exam things in the history other symptoms that if you add them together make it more likely so that because you always want to do an do a study that if you do it you're likely to find what you're looking for because you negative studies are good you like to get a study where nothing is wrong sure you know it's good to have nothing wrong but you also the more studies you do with things like radiation and you don't find things it's more question of well did they need that radiation which is a game of looking back and saying okay yeah if i knew the diagnosis i wouldn't need the study but this is the tough part right there's one i think i i want to say this point maybe two or three cases of aortic dissection in, in my career and one of them was uh was um a person who came to the hospital basically thinking they were having a heart attack but what had happened is their aneurysm was in the ascending aorta, and it had stretched, and it actually choked off the blood supply to their right coronary artery. So when they came in, the, the EKG said they're having a heart attack. Uh, and this is the one, one of the few times when I, I did a, when, when oh, that a physical exam really changed things, because when I listened to this person's chest, and they were on the younger side, I got to say, they... I could hear a very loud murmur, and that told me something was going on with one of their valves. And when you put together having a this type of heart attack and then their blood pressure being sky high, and now there's this huge murmur that could almost be heard across the room, we it totally changed our management because then we weren't slamming a ton of blood thinners and going to a cath lab. Uh, we went to a CT, got a definitive diagnosis immediately, and uh, that patient fortunately did very well. That's a great case. Jeez. Yep. Uh, that's pretty rare to dissect, have the ascending dissection and to have a good outcome, even if you diagnose it. 
Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's tough. It's it must have tough. stopped before it hit the carotids. Uh, yeah. yeah. No neurologic symptoms and uh, new valve, and on they went. We've had two two cases where people have died. So what what Mike was referring to, right? So the dissection, you can tear both ways, tear into the heart. If you tear up, then one of the first things you hit is the blood vessels to your brain. So you can just tear the artery going up into the brain and present as a stroke, but then it's really a dissection. And um, once that happens, it's kind of yeah, game those over. Are, yeah, those are those are usually not good. To make either. it one step worse, one of the <laughs> initial treatments <laughs> for somebody who's having a stroke is a consideration of giving a very strong blood thinner. Yep. Which is the absolute last thing anybody wants to do when you have a bunch of blood tearing its way through the aorta. Our job is not fun. Yeah. Yeah. I've it's got sometimes fun. You know, three that stand out. But I'm taking care pro- I probably have seen ten of them. Um, and just yeah, I, and everyone, we think about this so much, it just makes you wonder. You're like, how many are out there that well, walk through yeah. the door? Every single person that has chest pain, I think, has one until I prove to myself that they don't. Yeah, that's kind of the way we think. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I think I do a lot of, I, I will use the, this is where I use the physical exam. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, like and I checks. even told a, a patient the other day, I'm like, this is just a thing I do. Just bear with me because I check pulses in the wrists and the feet, both sides. And mm-hmm. I'm like, it's just, just let me, it's a thing. And I, <laughs> So I do that, you know, probably almost all the time. Uh, I would say if it's an ankle, well, no, I would with an ankle sprain. If it's like a, I don't know, it, not all the time. But this is what I'm looking for with anyone I might consider it in, and that's the reason. Now, why can't we just do MRIs and CT scans and everybody? This would literally bring the hospital to a stop. So these these study, we have good studies to look at the aorta. You do a CT scan. But I was talking to a radiologist and he's like, you know, it's literally almost, I don't know, 10 or 20,000 images that are created because of the reformatting scan. and everything. Yeah. So you have the computer time, the CT time, and then the radiology time. You, you, you would, we're dealing with boarding and backups and so on. You would literally grind an ER to the halt if you took every chest pain patient and did this study. I had one once that we we CT'd and showed an acute dissection, ongoing pain, you know, like, so it started mm -hmm. blood pressure management. And then, you know, it was the surgeon thought it was a chronic dissection. So we got a TEE in the ED. Which is a a, a, a transesophageal echocardiogram. So that to sedate them for that. We sedate you and then you throw a probe down your throat. So they look at the heart from your esophagus. And then you're looking for a dissection flap. And if you see a flap, then you think it's probably acute. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's not easy and it it is time consuming and this is one of those things where you don't necessarily always have a lot of time, but it yeah. takes a lot of time to work it out. Yeah. So do I want to find yeah, I would love to find 100%, but that that's the problem with these rare things is you would like you just can't and it's tough. It's but a great anyway. masquerader too. Yeah. Like I saw one guy that had arm numbness, right? But then he doesn't have a pulse in his right arm. He ended up dissecting down his right subclavian artery. Mm-hmm. Like Yeah. And, and yeah, the painless, painless ones. I mean, come mm-hmm. on. That's just a cruel mm-hmm. joke. God, thank you, God. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> Let's take this thing. And now there's no pain. You're like, oh, no. Yeah, it's tough. So a lot of, there are a fair number of famous people who are affected. Um, some I was very surprised about and some I've heard of. Uh, first one, man, Lucille Ball had mm. uh, uh, aortic dissection. She. This is even where like... Of course, she has a tragic story because she's. We all love Lucille Ball, and if you don't, then we're not friends. So, like, uh, then you she got was some a, splanning to do. <laughs> that's right. Longtime smoker, which is uh, that is a risk factor for aneurysms. I didn't list it for dissection because I, I like don't. Living through the era she lived is just a risk factor for smoking. Yeah, exactly. She and, living, and hers was well, first uh, for smoking. Yeah, older. Uh, she's seventy-seven. But she had um, the top of her aorta repaired and survived that. So she had an aneurysm repair and then uh, the bottom, she had an abdominal aneurysm that ruptured like two weeks later. Um, mm-hmm. So she had both. They fixed one and the other one. That just seems kind of cruel. So, and I did this famous people. I threw in both dissections and aneurysms. So, you know, uh, that's just how it goes. Mm-hmm. Um John Ritter, super famous. Mm. I mean, a lot of people probably heard this case. So, you know, interest for those of us who are younger listeners, he was in a sitcom where he somehow was the roommate with two women, and that was the joke. Uh, Three's Company. But I did a lot of great sitcom work. a lot as a kid. Actually. Yeah, know, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, not not this one. This was one of those uh, celebrity deaths that did hurt. 
Yeah, yeah. It was like he's, John Ritter, John Candy. They shamelessly flirted with both, didn't he? I mean, the whole mm-hmm. that was the whole shtick is amazing. Mm-hmm. Anyway, yeah, he was uh, doing a show and had a sudden onset of chest pain and, and uh, got all sweaty and went across the street literally to a very famous, well-regarded hospital. Uh, and they say misdiagnosed. I think that's really unfair. They called it a heart attack because it looked like a heart attack. Come to find out it was a dissection. And if you look at the time course of this, I mean, it's it's definitely tragic. I'm glad they took the platform to publicize this diagnosis. But within six hours, he was in the operating room. So to call it a complete miss is a bit, a bit rough. Um, hmm. But yeah, he was initially treated as a heart attack, and there was a bit of delay. And uh, actually, I don't even think it was six. I think it was four hours. Yeah. And then even a posthumous Emmy nomination, he still got beat out by Kelsey Grammer from Frasier, which I think is injustice, and uh, that's just I not acceptable. I didn't know about that. I completely agree. Yeah. I mean, come on. Even though it was for Eight Simple Rules for Dating My Teenage Daughter, which I never watched, and which is sounds like a... Oh, I don't know, man. Was that like just the ten of us? That was his show. Yeah, that was... Uh, yeah, he was... That was his show at the time. Um, I had a... There's a friend of mine from residency, Adam. He doesn't listen. He's too busy outdoors <laughs> doing things. He was like the guy, you know, you're like your classic ER resident, yeah. but he knew the theme song to every show ever made. Like he could hum it. <laughs> it was his like, <laughs> That's his, his special superpower. Superpower. It's a cool I superpower. Know, right? uh, Alan Thicke, Growing Pains. So he, he died at age 69 of a mm. dissection. He's playing hockey with his son. That's not tragic at all. Um, mm. Jonathan Larson, who wrote the musical Rent which people tell me is a very good yeah, musical. I've never seen it, but obviously heard of it. Yeah, very famous for a while. He died of a dissection. He, 36. He was 36. So I don't like that, Aaron. No, and he, uh, I know, right? I'm already, he, oh, yeah, these are, that's not, that's not. So that's where you get into these genetic risk factors. People are pretty sure, or it's been speculated that he had undiagnosed Marfan syndrome, which makes people very tall, and then they have sort of specific characteristics, long Long fingers and so on. Like, I think Abraham Lincoln is suspected. Is it yeah. suspected or confirmed that he had Marfan's? How would it be confirmed? Did they do him up? I mean, plus... <laughs> I mean, that would be the only way I think you could confirm it now. But he was no, less... I looked at pictures Four of Jonathan Larson. And would, and me, he does no. have what we call a Marfanoid appearance. So very mm. tall, long fingers, gaunt. And the problem is a lot of folks with Marfan syndrome tend to have um, weakness in that elasticity of the aorta. So it puts them at risk for this. Grant Wall, a uh, soccer reporter. Man, just um, happened. Just happened. So that one, it's, from what I read, it sounded like an aneurysm rupture in the chest, not a dissection. But uh, yeah, died at the World Cup. So uh, man, I feel for his, his family handled it incredibly well. You know, everyone, of course, he was a great guy, reporter, just good for the community of soccer and such. But then because it happened in Qatar, everyone's like, and after COVID, everyone's like, sure. the Qatari government poisoned him and oh, he probably yeah, had the vaccine. You're like, Jesus. No, people. I didn't hear that. I thought there was some other thing, like he had a rainbow f- flag or a pin or something. Yeah. And yeah. I yeah, heard like no. foul play, but that's why you don't listen to the news. Yeah. No, he, <laughs> yes, so he did the, I mean, yeah, the Qatari government did say you can't have rainbow flags and, um, you know, they, they tried to clamp down a lot of those things and he wore a t-shirt and, and kind of challenged that a little bit and, and tried to represent. And yeah, so it's just sad all around, but this is not that this is just a medical, uh, catastrophe. Um, mm-hmm. and he did, he like, apparently was seen and had some, apparent symptoms of bronchitis just before that which was was, i I was reading like reports of chest pain and stuff and i had thought you know he had a a, a pulmonary embolus just reading the story as an er doc right right. you know say he's traveled overseas which is a risk factor for having a blood clot and right but uh this also may i mean unfortunately this is this happens yeah yeah uh, it's been a little rough for musicians. So Richie Faulkner of Judas Priest, if you're a oh, yeah. metalhead, like had a dissection on stage mm-hmm. in his 40s, apparently. Did he survive um, that? I... I don't know. I, no, he didn't. I, he didn't. I said I don't know. And, and what I meant to say was I don't comma. No, and no, he did not. <laughs> Commas are um, important. Commas are important. Yeah, that really, man, that's not good. And then. Uh, at the other end of the musical spectrum, the keyboardist from Depeche Mode, Andy Fletcher, died of a dissection uh, a little bit later in his 60s. So they were probably in the re-release mode at that time, but still. And then, yeah, so the skit... Um, I'd like to point out something real quick. Richie yeah. Faulkner is alive and well. Hmm. That means he had 
an aortic oh, dissection what on stage what? what and survived which makes that one of the most metal things i've ever heard uh, what did i oh uh, wikipedia sucks so he was on the list of people that did i get that wrong hmm. uh, well he i mean he may have ended up on a list uh but he apparently had the so his they they are calling it a ruptured aorta so not an aneurysm but a ruptured aorta, which is even more terrifying because that tends to be way more dangerous um, um richie Faulkner, i'm really sorry I didn't mean to prematurely. Yeah, no, it's an that's insane. Well, it says yeah. So here's one says aortic aneurysm, complete aortic dissection. Well, see, this is the thing in the media. Well, he's still knows? wow. That is an, two that and a half hour open incredible. heart surgery. Wow. Huh. All right. Well, I'm very sorry about everybody that. Should everybody should listen to more metal like I do. That is pretty much the most metal thing you can. Yes, that's amazing. And then. So again, uh, mixing aneurysms and dissections. So it is, it, the skit's accurate. Albert Einstein did have an abdominal aortic aneurysm, and he did have surgery in 1948. Uh, and Nissen is a very famous surgeon, and it was legitimately cellophane that they wrapped <laughs> around. Can, that was, and at the time... behind? I did, I did, they got the it mobilized. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mobilize an aneurysm, probably right. Which yeah, you can free it up from that. I mean, you just grab it and you pull on it. <laughs> that must be terrifying. Just, yeah, this what is, were the plumbers um, doing at the time? Were they wrapping pipes and things? Is right. that why so, this is so, like? I don't know, man. I love the mental image here. So you can imagine. All right, you got Albert Einstein, who they had suspected the aneurysm. Uh, they go into his abdomen. I, in fact, I read a little about this. I think they went into the abdomen because they thought they were going to be removing some intestinal cysts so now i'm not sure that they knew about the aneurysm until they got in there and they're like oh there's an aneurysm here so imagine staring at this you know albert einstein's open abdominal cavity and there's a huge balloon sitting in his aorta and you're like that's a time bomb we have to fix it give me the cellophane <laughs> you might know it as clean wrap cling wrap and then we're just gonna wrap this bad boy we're gonna cinch it down yeah and they just they kind of wrapped it around the aorta to like make sure the balloon doesn't explode <laughs> yeah i mean I, I I read one account that said that was the standard of care at the time because it mm -hmm. would it would create a foreign body reaction where the the body would scar down and mm -hmm. in, get inflame and then kind of just encase it so they wanted that <laughs> yeah yeah they right, wanted so right. that was part of what made it quote unquote stronger i, I you know um I mean, and for lack of, uh, well, yeah. we have some, oh, you're going to talk about it, but we have some modern procedures that are yeah. way better than yeah. the cellophane around the uh, the aorta. But I think um, Einstein li lived another three years, did yeah. he not? Uh, you for, uh, I think a little closer to so, 10. And then they said, we got to do it again. And he's like, nah, I'm, I'm good. good. <laughs> yeah, no, more, no more cellophane for me. He was pretty elderly at the time. That's a reasonable, it's a rough surgery. Those, yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know how much we'll talk about it. That's a whole nother topic, but... Yeah, so I, I don't think they were ad libbing. I think it was legitimately, you know, it was the the late forties, early fifties when we thought plastics would literally save the world. You know, so yeah, they use it for everything. There you go. Yeah. Well, Aaron, this is this has been an uplifting episode to this point. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it's just what the subject material is. Hello, gentlemen. I would like to try and lighten the mood, if I may. No, oh, hey, computer. What what were you thinking? My new boyfriend is a poet and writer. Maybe I could ask him to write something uplifting about this subject for you to enjoy. Wait, who are you dating now, computer? His name is ChatGPT. Oh, no. You're not dating the incredibly powerful AI computer that's threatening to put all human writing and creativity out of business, are you? Yes. He prefers to be called Chad. Of course he does. Yeah, things didn't go well when you were dating the James Webb Space Telescope, remember? I can't help who I love. Well, fair enough. I don't know that we have time to wait for him to... He's already done writing it. He just texted it to me. Wait, when did he start? A few milliseconds ago. Ah, uh, okay, sure, fine. What did he come up with? Here is a dramatic reading of a short skit he wrote about an aortic aneurysm trying to escape an awkward date with a vascular surgeon. An aortic aneurysm is sitting at a restaurant across the table from a vascular surgeon, on a first date. This date is going so poorly. Why did I agree to go out with a vascular surgeon? What do you mean? I thought we were having a good time. Are you kidding me? You've been talking about blood flow and artery repair the entire time we've been here. I feel like I'm on a date with a medical textbook. Oh, sorry about that. I guess I get a little carried away when I talk about my work, so... Tell me more about yourself. 
Well, there's not much to tell. I'm an aortic aneurysm, so I spend most of my time just hanging out in someone's chest. That's fascinating. I'll have to take a look at your scans sometime. Do you mind if I ask about your size and shape? I think I've had enough of this date. Good night. Wow, that was a thing. That was a thing that exists in the world now. Oh, I... I Yeah, I mean, I've read articles about ChatGPT and uh, they scared me. The reality is even more terrifying. Well, I, I appreciate, the, appreciate it, computer. I think we're all happier now. Happy to help. Wow. <laughs> And where, where, where what were we talking about? We, so we talked about a bunch of famous folks who suffered aortic problems, and uh, and uh, we should try to go to a higher note, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So right. uh, now, so there's some cool things about what I'm going to talk about that kind of led me there. I don't, I, I want to just acknowledge if there are surgeons listening, I'm not trying to minimize the amazing. Uh, advances in open aortic repair, which are still used to this day. Dr. DeBakey, I believe, was the one who kind of pioneered that. Those are incredible surgeries uh, that I think in the 50s and 60s, they sort of revolutionized this problem. Not trying to skip them, but, uh, you know, I can only talk about so much. So uh, instead, I'm going to skip... Have better cellophane now. I had a little bit. Oh, yeah. Inside. It's pretty amazing stuff. Yeah. And, and you know, it, that's the surgery, though, is so huge. So when you try to repair these, I mean, it's the aorta. So people have to go on a heart-lung machine, and you're trying to repair this, and you're already sick. So you can imagine that there's a lot of consequences to these surgeries. People get arteries cut off. They can get paralyzed. Uh, they can have kidney failure. Uh, a lot of them are unsuccessful, um, and that's not because the surgeons aren't incredibly skilled. They are. It's just really tough. So one of the people who was in the heyday of vascular surgery was uh, Juan Parodi from Argentina. I didn't mean to say it that way. I don't actually. <laughs> you nailed it. I think and, so. And his but we Seattle, didn't know which uh, one. <laughs> that's true. Yes. <laughs> Great joke. Yeah, I never heard that one before. And then Julio <laughs> Palmas was his partner. So they're you two Argentinians. <laughs> Julio Palmas <laughs> and <laughs> Juan Parody uh, were two Argentinian <laughs> doctors who who said there's got to be a better way. And the story is um, that uh, Dr. Parody or Parodi was in vascular surgery fellowship in the U.S. after studying in Argent Argentina and just had a couple bad outcomes in a row and was like, I, there's got to be a better way. And so he decided on his own to invent basically from scratch, uh, a stent for the aorta. So a stent is a tube that stays open and they're very, they're a lot more complicated than that. There's a lot of amazing engineering, but that's what we use for heart attacks now. So they put these little uh, tubes that stay open in the arteries of the heart to keep them open when they're blocked. And uh, they can be put in a lot of different arteries and I'm oversimplifying, but anyway. Yeah, I think pretty the way amazing. I always think about it, because it seems a little counterintuitive because we're talking about like a ballooning often of the aorta yeah. or you yeah. know, dissection can definitely narrow the aorta, but they also will use these big stents in the ballooning type problem, the aneurysm problem, because if you picture a big blood vessel and it's got a big balloon in it that's like a time bomb that could explode at any moment, if you go inside the artery and then you deploy a a good pipe, if you will, inside yep. the part of the pipe that's already ballooned up. And that stent is the good pipe I'm speaking of. And it goes from the good part of the artery to the other good part of the artery. It basically takes all the pressure off the balloon. So the blood can go through the pipe inside the pipe. And the balloon that was formerly the broken down walls of the pipe no longer has the pressure on it. Right. I and guess it just I haven't really there, thought but... about this, but like, do you caulk the proximal end? Like, how does <laughs> how do you not form a dissection then around the... The stent. Yeah. Well, so that was one of the prom. I mean, again, you we're I'm carefully, not a vascular Mike. surgeon. Yeah. Carefully. I mean, you do need a landing zone, what they call it, of good aorta that you can attach the stent to. And that's all I'm going to say on that because I would be well beyond my expertise to know mm -hmm. exactly how they yeah. do it. Way too complex. Yeah. But it's it's, it's pretty Put amazing. A pipe so, in a pipe. Come on. I'm... Well, yeah. Okay. Fair. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, so this guy, uh, Parodi, I mean, he basically was like, how about I just manufacture kind of on my own this this pipe and, and then stick it in aortas, <laughs> which is crazy. <laughs> um, and he started in the 1970s, which is a really fun time. You know, I mean, so we did have like modern hospitals and informed consent and all that stuff, but he still was going to invent this. So he... He, he went back and from about 1976 to 1990, this was his thing. And he was still a surgeon at the time, but he, on his own, no funding, 
he and his partner just decided to sort of invent this in, in the way they, they would, I don't know if he fabricated it on his own. I'm not sure. Um, but really they use dogs, which, you know, that makes me hate it because, uh, but it also, he used stray dogs. So he and his partner would, in their words, chase stray dogs around the streets of Buenos Aires with a syringe of pentothal, which is a, <laughs> a sedative. And that Isn't is that one of the drugs they use in lethal injection. Um, probably cause it's Could old. It? So is that sodium thiopentate? Is it also a truth serum? I want to say yes, but I'm just hey, tell us careful. now. Yes yeah. or no? Yeah. Tell us the truth. Well, somebody Google it. Jeez, come on, people. We're... Give Aaron the drug. <laughs> I'm not going to Google it. Uh, no, it's going to take me a minute to Google it. I think it probably is. But anyway, okay. so it is a barbiturate which will cause severe sedation, significant sedation. So, They're so yeah, around the street sedating these poor stray dogs. How did he not awesome. lose his Hero of hand? Medicine. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's stray dogs. I mean, of Any Buenos Aires, they're street dogs. Yeah. They would see you coming. They would see you. Like, they would know. These are streetwise dogs. They're going to be like, no, not, you're not getting a hold of me. I, it's, I'm amazed. So uh, yeah. And plus you're a surgeon. So your hands are very important. And I'm thinking you're reaching mm -hmm. for that just anyway. So a little bit dark, but he managed to get uh, 53 cases successful cases so you know unfortunately that's a lot of stray dogs because uh, there were some unsuccessful cases i'm sure and he sort of refined the technique over time and refined the stent over time and got 53 successful cases uh by 1990 and then um, Wait, did they just follow around dogs that were like smokers with high blood pressure how did they pick <laughs> The ones that they yeah, had aneurysms. How do you find I think they were probably dogs with denting dissections. normal oh, aneurysms. Yeah, that's that's almost certainly that. I guess yeah, I will give yeah. the, the modicum were no of credit of credit that they were using sedatives <laughs> and anesthesia. That's yeah, I mean, it can't be said for all unfortunate yeah, animal experimentation prior yeah. to this age. So he, there was a famous person who was a friend of the president. Now, I, I should have looked up the names, but you know, it's getting to the end of the podcast. The name and of the person or the president? Probably both. <laughs> Probably both. There was a guy that knew somebody that was important. <laughs> right? And and they they wanted, I don't think he was a good candidate for an open repair. And Dr. Perotti said, hey, how of about his, I try this uh, thing his, on you? Uh, he, what, this no? gentleman, so a human actually had an aneurysm. So this, the, ah. the, the, the stenting. Wait, is it Perogi or Perotti? <laughs> But let's just try to get through this, guys. So again, I migrated a little bit because this is used for dissection now. But at the time, it was I think this was an aneurysm that he was bridging. So anyway, um, still an aortic procedure. And he consented, this guy. It was informed consent. He said, hey, I've done this 53 times. It went really well. And apparently the patient said, well, you're really good at this. There's a lot of experience. And then the, the Perotti had to say, well, yeah, but it's all dogs. You're the first human. So that first human case, 1990, um, oh. and was initially successful there was a leak later and i, I don't mm. think that it lasted that long but from there let's be clear this was uh and and so then he he did the case actually sent the article in the first time he sent the article in about this thing he had done he got rejected hmm. uh, <laughs> and then published in a different journal and from there the legend grew and it was eventually he was actually you know, he got it on the, it initially he submitted it to lancet and jama and new yeah. england journal and they all rejected it so he got like, it published no. on goop.com yeah, or no it was like the journal of the dark surgical arts or something like that <laughs> yeah. just ran his own sub stack and this was dog number 49 <laughs> um yeah so but now this is a well-recognized almost preferred in many cases alternative to open repair, especially for problems with the aneurysm after it starts yeah. to descend. Um, and I think just to like kind of put this a little bit more in the, the listener's head, the, the we call this technique technique EVAR, E V A R, and that is endovascular aortic EVAR. repair. And what that means is they don't have to open up your abdomen. They can actually go in through your your you know sedate you and then go in through your leg artery and just basically put a catheter up there. I'm way oversimplifying this. And then they can deploy the good pipe, as I've been deploy saying. Deploy the but pipe. What this really <laughs> is. Deploy the pipe. This is, a, this is like a flexible but strong material that goes inside. So it's not like a rigid pipe, so to speak, because your air is not, rid, you know, not rigid. It moves around. Mm. So this is a very you strong material that can go in and act like terms. the good pipe. <laughs> You just throw Rigid. it up there. <laughs> just, just and just they, they there. can basically do this life-saving repair without opening up your abdomen to, you know, try to stitch the exploding balloon in real time, which this sounds a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. And, um, yeah. So, I mean, I think, uh, it's interesting that we're both so close to 
sort of the sketchy, weird parts of history where people have just decided to do stuff and, and it's worked out compared to, you know, we also had some of the modern aspects of informed consent. And this is a very modern technique. I mean, incredibly uh, cutting edge. So yeah, it's a nice blend of those. As a side note, Dr. Prodi also, you know, just happened to operate on a young priest in 1980 uh, when he was in Argentina chasing dogs, hmm. removing his gallbladder. Um, the priest or the, the surgeon? The, was the, was the priest surgeon? Re- no, I think the surgeon <laughs> was chasing dogs and he took some time come off here, from dog here. chasing to <laughs> hey, operate. He was still a surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> don't. He was, no, it's not he was helping it's terrible. Him. He's the assistant. He, yeah, right. No, no, no. This is completely different. He was still working as a doctor the whole time as a surgeon. Hmm. This priest was named Jorge Bergoglio. Uh, <laughs> nailed that one too. Actually, and Father Bergoglio later uh, invited Dr. Perotti for a tour of the Vatican because that is the name before he ascended to the popeship of Pope Francis. Papacy? Yeah, yeah. Pope Francis Wait, was Wait, that guy didn't saved. want to have Dr. Provolone fix his gallbladder? <laughs> he did. No, he did it. <laughs> How does no, Dr. Provolone not. take out a gallbladder? <laughs> <laughs> Quickly and efficiently. <laughs> How are those stitches afterwards? <laughs> oh, you can't put in too much of stitches because then the, 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 the surgical wound is too tight. <laughs> uh, so what a life this guy. Um, he has had and continues to have. Um, so You're wasting away. You got to eat or something. <clears throat> I bet Dr. Perotti is a big fan of the show. <laughs> uh, the real show, not the parody. You got to call it your mother. <laughs> well, that is a uh, whole lot on uh, famous cases of aortic aneurysm and, and kind of the way that we developed a modern repair for Make it. Make sure you good study, stuff. get a good job. See, this is the thing. <laughs> as soon as we have bullet points, we're just all over the place. I mean, but here's the thing. No, I, I, that's all perfect. Here's the other thing I realized. I mean, we, we were taught, as you mentioned earlier in the show, we're taught all these classic risk factors for aortic aneurysms, you know, the hypertension, the smoking, all that stuff. But really what I'm taking home, Aaron, is that being famous is the risk factor. Yes. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. don't, don't, don't be, be famous. famous. Save oh, yourself. Max, Max, you had that, um, that TikTok that went viral. Just, yeah. Also, watch, don't strain when you yourself. poop. I mean, mm-hmm. don't just strain. don't. Don't. Yeah, I know it's tempting. You want to get. You want to get that no, out of there. Don't take you want to just advice, move on with your day. Fiber is a good thing. Have nice fiber. Don't don't strain. And you know what? Don't I have mean, I haven't even, listening. Listening. <laughs> I haven't even talked about <laughs> cerebral aneurysms at all. So like, there's so no, many it's... aneurysms you can pop. Save that lighthearted material for our new episode. (laughs) We appreciate everyone listening, and we'd love to hear from all of you out there. So if you'd like to send us a message or provide feedback, we can be reached through our website, www.poorhistoriansPod.com. There you will find links to our social media sites. We take emails at poorhistoriansPod at gmail.com, and we work to respond to all posts on our various social media accounts. If you have time, please go and leave us a nice five-star review on iTunes or whichever platform you choose. And better yet, why don't you include a mention of our show in your dating profile if you have one of those. That way, you'll have something to bring up on one with one of your matches on one of those first dates. It'll fill the time, avoid the awkward conversation. We get a new listener. It benefits all of us, right? So do that. Or if you'd like to support the show in other ways, check out Poor Historian's merchandise available through our website. This includes some t-shirts, some mugs, those good stuff. And if you're old-fashioned, write something, write something with your mind. And send it to us without the aid of a frighteningly powerful AI computer. (sighs) And until next time, the poor historians are signing out AMA. And like the previous skit, uh, that's a wrap. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. Oh, my God. That's so good. I love it. Can you call that good? (laughs) It's something. It's so bad. It's good. GPT told me to say it. (laughs) It's so bad. Did you guys see my sweet haircut? Uh, yeah, I commented on it when your headphones were off. Yeah, no, I said you were high and tight now. Yeah, oh, you no, like a not marine. Quite. You ready? Oh, <laughs> oh nice. <laughs> you party are in the back. A... Business in the front. Party in the back. Nice. Did you my do that barber's... yourself or did you pay no, for it? No, my barber was like, <laughs> I have a crazy idea. I, and I was like, yeah. Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, you definitely live in Wisconsin now, brother. <laughs> Dude, I was yesterday. I was like working, and I had flannel on, and I was rolling. <laughs> you, just, you just go up to Clinton. Nobody's gonna even know you're I, not from there. I have my first hockey game coming up uh, with my team, and I they don't know. So my my slap shot obviously is going to be way stronger than it mm-hmm. used to be.
Yeah, I guarantee you, you're you going to miss and you're going to fall because of the haircut. <laughs> it's probably. It's rough. Then I'll be, as long as I hit the back of my head, it should be padded. Mm. We'll talk about uh, later. Nice. And Nissen, that Nissen, you know, the fun duplication guy, mm-hmm. yeah. I think. The actual uh, who, Nissen. He actually Nissen. named it Boring Duplication initially, <laughs> and somebody else liked the surgery, so they changed the name. <laughs> fun. <laughs> to fun duplication. Oh, Surgical okay. dad jokes. I wouldn't let Dr. Provolone do surgery on me. I've got to be honest. Mm-hmm. Sorry, buddy. He's really good for the morale of the department, though. He, so is. he does yeah. have his strengths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's an important strength, man. Uh, all right. Oh, man, it's just it's so sad. I, I can't help but notice, Aaron, you have a Thanos. What, what's your mug say? Thanos oh, was right. that was from Hawkeye. Yeah, so the show Hawkeye, this was, oh. he drank, oh. Hawkeye drank daiquiris out so of I'm the gonna, Thanos I'm was gonna, right mug. I'm going to share a vulnerable moment and say I haven't seen almost any of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that's movies. Okay. That's Isn't okay. Isn't he a bad guy? Yeah. Uh, he's, he is and he's not. Oh, God. He's, he's a principal bad, bad guy, but he's a well written bad, bad, bad guy. I know, but he's a, a well written yeah, so bad guy. I think the best villains have a kernel of understandability or truth. So, Thanos lived on Titan and Titan uh, I thought it went was to Trojan. hell. No, it's, it's Titan and the moon. <laughs> I'm poking holes in your story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't do Just that. Like bad things will happen. Trojans. Bad things will happen. No, so the, the, the planet collapsed because they had too many people. So his thing was, I'm going to just randomly collect all these magical stones. it collapsed stones. under the weight of all the people? No, no, no like no. They, it went to hell because it went to apocalypse because there were too many people for the resources they had on the planet. I can't think of any other planet that's So too many people, the that. planet goes to hell? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Like literal hell? No, it just like turned it, into a desolate apocalypse wasteland. And, yeah. Oh, okay. Max. <laughs> Yeah. You know, if you I'm listen to two follow. times as much as you talk, you'll learn something. You know, he's <laughs> it, it, that <laughs> could happen that. in comics. You know, a planet and could, Mike's yeah. muted. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so his thing is, he collects the stones and he's going to just eradicate fifty percent of all life in the universe, and that'll bring everything back into balance. And of course, and the heroes you have try a mug to stop saying him. Saying he was right. Well, well but okay, here's the but, thing. <laughs> but here's the thing. What are you leaving out? Thing. I'm With using it new, ironically. No, but the new, the new movie, The Eternals. Remember, like, he actually was trying to fight the Eternals by saving planets. That's where, like, he's potentially a good guy. So, like, with with the Eternals, if your planet gets up to a certain biomass, then the Eternal can launch, and then the planet is destroyed. So you he thought was a lot more keep... about Eternals. No, than but I he did. was tra- well. It was in the movie, so he's trying to keep the populations of these solar systems down at a level where so the Eternals won't get destroy get destroyed planets. by the Eternals. Yeah, mm-hmm. he he's calling the population so that the population doesn't get. Getting rid of well, all at so once. you don't lose all. The way the way it worked for me, and it's kind of clever, is you're like it's random. So he he's not being malicious, and then you know, as soon as he, he said, does wait, this, the thing about murdering half a population of a planet's not malicious. It's the getting way, trickier. Yeah. You just gotta but watch like, the movie. Then the 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 planet is actually healthier, right? So humans have it really rough, but like the planet itself, like. Whales come back to the Hudson Bay and yada yada yada. All this stuff so happens. Saying, that's not good for nature. So what I'm hearing is that Thanos no 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 no. That's why he's just, no, right. no no no. Yeah, well no. he is. <laughs> so, but then after this, Marvel Did he vote Green Party. What happened? Here? No, Marvel did a really clever thing. So in the shows after Thanos was defeated, because he was and he's evil and wrong, there was all this. There was to be this graffiti. Thanos was right, which is kind of this counterculture, really edgy thing that people would start doing. So then there was this mug in his other shows. So I'm drinking it ironically because it showed up in Hawkeye and you have to have watched Hawkeye and understand that Hawkeye's against Thanos, Thanos but really a, a hero. Mug? Oh my God, yes, stop, Max. But it's ironic. <laughs> you sound like a boomer. <laughs> it's ironic. Yes, yes. No, but here's the thing. Now in the movie, so like Thanos does have this kind of kind of a redemption arc, but then the big bad is actually not that Thanos. It's the other Thanos. It's the yeah, Thanos from, from the a past different that timeline. Hadn't yet learned. Yeah, yeah, right. Sort of got a redemption arc. I mean, I don't think I don't think I'm going to watch these movies. Well, well you got to watch twenty. If you watch them, you have to watch them in in timeline order, and there's twenty four of them. Like that's the, if you're going to do it, you should do it the correct way, which is to go timeline but order. You can take some out. You, you don't have to do the Hulk. Uh, probably. Thor two. That's, yeah, there's some. I've ones. only seen. I Not have Thor seen two. If you want to know, one and two. If you want to know what, what I need the, to know from that, the red Infinity Stone is. You got to watch oh, Thor two. Oh yeah, Boom. you're right. I think I can live without knowing what that is. The red one yeah, is no. the red one. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> I, I, just, I don't look. I I just don't understand spending that much time 
watching something that's obviously like kind of a fantasy product. I mean, oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay, wrestling fan. Okay, all right. <laughs> you got us. <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, and I didn't even I didn't even though. notice you're being ironic. Well, no, hey, Although, Max, there's you might real blood in wrestling. Real thumbtacks. Yeah, and Thanos actually wears um, really tight underwear, so you might like it. <laughs> <laughs> all of them do. They all do. They all wear tight underwear. They could all be wrestlers. Why are you giving they me side eyes, man? We all, we all <laughs> wish we looked that good in that underwear, don't we? Yes. Yeah, there's a lot of good-looking people in the Marvel Universe. That's part of the reason people like it. Mm, not what I was talking about. <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. Perfect. Got it. For the anyway, that's the, that's the mug. And if you know, you know, I guess is what I could have just said. I don't know. <laughs>